PowerPoint or is it PDF? Yeah, it looks like PowerPoint.
Charles Nazarian, and it's my pleasure to be your host this afternoon. I'm the president of the Gloucester Meeting House Foundation, and our responsibility is for the major restoration projects on this building, uh, which has the distinction of being on the National Historic Register. Uh, this Meeting House uh, was built in 1806, and it has an illustrious history uh, in which the founders were uh, part of the Revolutionary War period and were great believers in not only the uh, equality of all persons, but the equality of rights for all persons uh, who uh, at the time might have seemed outside of the, of the mainstream. Uh, that theme runs through the entire history of this place. And if you'd like to know more about the stories, um, in particular, uh, the stories of how this building is connected to the First Amendment separation of church and state, that entire story is on the website at gloucestermeetinghouse.org. And I encourage you to go there and, and check it out. It's a very interesting story. Um, Reverend John Murray, who was the founder and who held the first Universalist service in America in 1774 in the home of the Sargent family was the start. And his wife, Judith Sargent Murray, whose home is a museum just up the street, was his partner every step of the way. John Murray believed in a loving creator. And uh, he argued that the uh, scriptures actually point to a loving God who wants all of his children to return to the light from which they came. And he meant that not only for men and women equally, but also for people of all places all around the world. That was an extremely revolutionary idea. But it caught on here in Gloucester, and it's one of the reasons why this building is built so large. Uh, there are 600 seats in this sanctuary. And when we're through with its renovation, which we hope will be in the next three years on the interior, uh, the 600 seats will be restored and we'll be able to have concerts and gatherings uh, with that large capacity and in a room with extraordinary acoustics. The building was built by a master builder whose name was Jacob Smith. And the first church that he built on Cape Ann is the Congregational Church in Rockport, which is two years older than this one. Uh, this one, like the Congregational Church, was modeled on builders' companion books that specified what the height, width, and length should be for the ideal acoustics. And of course, they were made with very, very fine, hard materials, like thick plaster over lath and, um, and wood, and so our walls have a wonderful resonance for music as well as for the spoken word. I'd also like to point out that there are many things here in the room that are part of the history. One of them is the Willard Clock, which is on the back wall, and which is keeping good time, and was here in 1806 at the opening. And when we have our break times at 10 minutes of the hour, you'll be able to rely on that and when you hear the clock ding, that's the time to come back in for us to start the next segment. Uh, some of you are seated in the middle of the room under a blown glass chandelier, which was made in the 1820s. And it was originally filled with whale oil and uh, drops to the floor so that you could fill the canisters of glass with whale oil. Today, we drop it to the floor to fill it with LEDs. And the entire building has come up to the present time. This is one of the few buildings of its type in the country that is completely carbon balanced. We've been able to increase our uh, insulation factors and tightness of the building at the same time, reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. And with some mitigation uh, of planting some forests in Costa Rica, uh, the meeting house is actually carbon neutral. And so we're very proud of that. And we're gonna keep working in that direction. This is uh, the first time that a uh, Gloucester Meeting House event is being live streamed on YouTube. And so I wanna say a special greeting to all of those who are watching us from home. Uh, we had a slightly bumpy road 
getting up onto YouTube, and uh, we hope that you've all made the little jump that we asked you to make from Gloucester Meeting House over to the UU Church YouTube channel. If you're watching this, obviously, you've made the jump. Um, uh, somehow, there's always some little electronic thing that gets you in the end. Um, just on some very simple things, uh, we are trying to be as safe as possible. And so, as you saw, as you came in, uh, we asked people to mask here in the building. But because we want to serve refreshments for you at break times, uh, all of that is available outside. So please avail yourself of coffee and baked goods and uh, good stuff out on the steps. It's a little cool, but um, sunny out there. And so we hope that you'll enjoy that. Um, if in the process of the afternoon you're in need of a washroom, uh, the closest one is through the door behind me. And if that's busy, there are two more downstairs. So um, I will hand over to Sandy Ronan, uh, who will tell us a bit more about the program. And then we'll introduce uh, the group of people who are here today uh, to talk about immigration and uh, refugees and this new era in which we're in. And we are particularly happy that we have two people here who have been through the immigrant or refugee process themselves. And one of the things we wanted to focus in on uh, after the, our last summer event, when Seth Moulton talked to us about the need to take care of Afghan refugees, is to have the voices of people themselves who have been through the process and the people who have been helping them find their way tell us what they need, as opposed to uh, people assuming that they know what they should do. It's the people who have been through this process who can tell us what would be most helpful. And so that focus and a broader look at what's happening uh, with immigration and, and uh, refugees in our country we thought would be uh, a topic that was really of our time and uh, would help us learn a lot. So Sandy is the chair of our events committee and um, she uh, helps pull together all of these programs through the year. We have a concert and event series every month from September through May and then July and August and the first week in September we have a weekly outdoor concert that is a benefit for a different nonprofit. And Sandy's responsible for pulling all of those cats together. Sandy, I think she deserves a round of applause. So good afternoon and uh, welcome. Uh, we're delighted that uh, you've come today and for, to those that are listening um, online, uh, we welcome you too. Uh, I'm going to make this short because we have a, a full uh, agenda this afternoon, um, but, uh, but I think it's always great when we can come together and, and listen and learn about current important issues. We're grateful to the presenters uh, for giving us some of their precious time. They're very busy in, uh, with their organizations and also individually uh, trying to uh, help most of us understand and, ha and increase our awareness of how complex and, and challenging the whole immigration process is. And uh, so we look forward this afternoon to hearing their stories and um, to feel um, stimulated so that we can find uh, a little way that we can be helpful in this process. Um, I guess we basically be believe everybody can do a little something, but we need to figure out and hear what's already being done and then where we go from here. Um, and, and as I said, we're grateful to the presenters for giving us that time because they're busy not only educating others, but being on the ground, helping um, new people come and settle in and feel welcome in, in our world. Um, so I will just say a, a sentence or two introducing the presenters and then we'll let them tell their stories. Um, and then in, uh, in the, at the end, we'll come together, everybody will come together for questions and answers. And uh, we will uh, actually be thinking of 
um, being able to write down your questions because we'll take a look at them and try to organize it so that it's uh, efficient. Um, so uh, this afternoon we're going to start with um, Elsa Bell Rincon and um, she is the founder and executive director of the Welcome Immigrant Network in Salem, Massachusetts. She's also uh, been a recent recipient of the Peter J. Gomes Service Award which was presented recently uh, by Seth uh, Moulton. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you, um, El Elsa Bell. You, you can come up and uh, if that's Right. Thank you so much. I'm going to take this off so I can use my glasses and see you all. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Charles and Sandy, for the invitation um, for me to be here today and join you and be in good company. And also for the opportunity to share a bit of my experience and my work. So a little bit about me. I was born in the Dominican Republic and moved to Salem, Massachusetts when I was 10 years old with my three younger siblings and my father. And my mother ended up joining us about a year later um, due to immigration processes and laws. Um, and when I moved here, the first, the most vivid memories I have of when I moved here was that I only seem to remember two phrases in English. One was, I don't speak English. And the second was, please don't go from a Milli Vanilli song. Does anybody remember Milli Vanilli? Yeah, please don't go. So <laughs> that wasn't very useful back then. And the second memory I have was my first field trip in middle school. So when I came here, I entered actually the seventh grade, although I was fairly young for a seventh grader at 10. And on my first field trip, I, uh, my mother packed me mashed plantains, which are, you know, are mashed potatoes, with sauteed onions and fried salami. So when I opened up at lunchtime, everybody knew <laughs> what I was having for lunch. Um, and those things are just markers of what, when I started to understand that I was different from the mainstream, right? Um, and sort of started my journey to integration as a young immigrant in Salem. The other thing was um, that I first didn't realize that I grew up in a mixed status family. And for those of you that might not be familiar with that term, a mixed status family is a family that might have members who are US citizens or legal permanent residents, right, authorized. You might have members who are not authorized, undocumented, right? Um, or as some people might refer to, illegals. Right? So we had those members of our family, and I realized that when agents came to the door one day looking for a family member, and I had um, overheard enough adult conversations that I probably shouldn't have to be able to say, no, that person doesn't live here, and I don't know that individual, and ended up saving that individual from deportation at that time, not really understanding what I was being a part of. So that sort of what shaped my personal, some of what shaped my personal experiences um, as an immigrant in Salem. In that experience with years of working in community engagement and violence prevention work, primarily with domestic violence and sexual assault survivors, in doing that work with a focus on vulnerable populations like immigrant communities and limited English speaking populations was what brought me to start um, the Welcome Immigrant Network. The Welcome Immigrant Network, we're a 100% volunteer grassroots group based out of Salem, Massachusetts. We primarily focus on Salem, Peabody, and the Beverly area. Um, but we will help anybody that comes to our door within our capacity. 
And our mission is to really create social change and empower the immigrant communities with an asset-based model, understanding that our experiences and our skills can contribute to the larger community, right? But also validating the impact of the immigrant experience because the immigrant experience, even under the best of circumstances, can be very traumatic. So our vision is that immigrants will be better able to maintain dignity, seek opportunity, and find security in their lives as they go through this process of integration and acculturation. And what does that look like for an all-volunteer group? We provide a lot of resources and referrals. Um, we put out a lot of publications around immigration, do workshops and trainings, we put on community events, but also have started to formalize our programming with two major offerings. One is the highly skilled immigrant integration. And a highly skilled immigrant is someone who arrives here with at least a bachelor's degree or higher or some professional experience. Now, a lot of people think that they have to completely start over, which is, might seem impossible for a lot of individuals to re-enter their former fields, but there's a lot of avenues and there's right now a lot of increased um, interest and focus in creating pathways to support the integration of this immigrant professional, primarily because we figure out um, that this causes what's known as a brain drain, brain waste phenomenon where individuals are underemployed or unemployed and their skills are underutilized. And this is costing the United States 39.4 billion in lost earnings and 10.2 billion in foregone taxes annually. Um, so there's definitely a larger, a lot of interest um, in supporting this work. And of course, during the pandemic, during the last 18 months, a lot of our work has been on supporting the members of our community who did not have access um, to the financial support um, through the pandemic, of the financial impact caused by the pandemic. So people who were left out of the stimulus, who could not qualify for unemployment and other form of assistance. So we have processed about 600 requests for assistance in our communities um, in the form of direct cash assistance to pay rent and utilities and grocery stores gift cards. So that's a little bit of the Welcome Immigrant Network. But what I want to share with you all today is a little bit of contextualized immig contextualize immigration in the United States within you know, uh, the next 10 minutes or so, give you 200 years of history. Let's do it, no, I'm just kidding. No, um, but I'll talk a little bit about um, immigration in the United States, some of the key legislative responses, who was coming and why, um, because I think it's important to help us understand where we've come from to understand how we are, where we are today. Um, and especially with so much going on at the national level with immigration legislation and just immigration in general, um, border security, um, we've just recently pulled out of Afghanistan that has huge implications for migration. Climate change has huge, huge implications for migration. And those are two of the three biggest threat the United States has identified to our nation with the third one being China. So all of this have definitely huge impacts to immigration. And let's see if this works here. This is... No. So I'm not sure this is working here. This is a little like graphic video that shows you the migration flows throughout the period of history. Um, but I also have tablets out there which you can play with after and you can see them on the tablets on the piano after in an interactive immigration timeline. Um, but for the purposes of time, so my approach to immigration is that it's one of the most uh, human acts since the beginning of time as well as an act of survival. So this is how I approach the subject and given my experience. Patterns are related to geographic location from sending and receiving countries as well as our history and our international and foreign policy. So today, 90% of Americans can trace their heritage as descendants of immigrants or direct immigrants. Um, and to quickly cover, the United States can be broken down into four major waves of migration. The first one, soon after the signing of the Constitution from 1790 to about 1820, um, where approximately 1.2 million immigrants, mostly English, Scots, and Scott Irish and German, um, arrived. During this time, we also had forced migration of people from the African continent through the slave trade. Right? Um, and during this period, we see the first two immigration acts enacted 
1790 uh, Naturalization Act, which granted citizenship to any alien being a free white person. So this is the beginning of what is the definition of being in America, and this definition is what's being used against every single wave of immigrant that comes thereafter. Um, at this time, we also, um, through the alien sedition laws, uh, made the first legislation that gave the, the government the power to deport immigrants. The second wave um, was most of the 1800s, 1820 to 1860. Um, we had the Industrial Revolution at this time. This wave was dominated by Irish and German Catholics. Um, we had the Gold Rush, which attracted other, it started to attract other immigrants, primarily from South East Asia. So then the response to that was, um, well, prior to that was the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which seized lands from the native people to support the expansion um, of this population from um, European immigrants. And then we quickly move on to the third wave of migration at the end of the 1800s until about 1914. This was the largest wave of migration in US history with 22.3 million immigrants, um, primarily European immigrants coming to the United States, averaging 650,000 people a year entering the country. This was the period of Ellis Island. We had Angel Island out in the West Coast. Um, and again, we see legislative responses. Oh, um, and this is the first time that we start seeing more non-European immigrants and Eastern European immigrants coming in. So we have Italians, Polish, Greeks, Hungarians, Jews, Russian coming in um, who were not very welcome at the time. So if you look through history books, you can see the Irish need not apply signs and a lot of political cartoons warning against the threat of foreigners to um, the United States and the national security of the country. So some of the legislative responses um, during this time included the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, which prevented Chinese workers from immigrating, um, an expansion of that through the, Great, uh, through the Geary Act of 1892. We had the 1917 Immigration Act after World War I, which barred um, people from pretty much the whole Asian continent from migrating to the United States. After that, um, you know, the Depression, World War II. After this period, we entered the fourth wave of migration, which started about in 1965, and it's still going on today. This is the first time, and if you had seen the graphic, you would have seen the shift color on the map move to Latin America and the African continent. So this is for the first time in United States history where we have a large number of immigrants that are non-European, that are non-white. And up to this period, we had immigration quotas based on national origins that highly favored European immigrants. So all of this was facilitated by the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act, which re-examining these quotas, prioritized attracting skilled workers and reuniting immigrant family members. Now statistically, because the majority of the population was of European origin, this would have favored European immigrants still. But at this time in history, Europe was doing relatively well politically and economically. And we had a lot of political instability in countries in Africa, Latin America, and the Asian continent, right? Developing economies, um, shifts to democracy, challenging authoritarian governments. So those individuals had a much greater need and interest to migrate in the US, had much more attractive factors attracting them here. So it didn't quite work out with the numbers that we were expecting, and it attracted this larger number of immigrants um, from Latin America and the African continent. Um, so uh, from today, uh, what that looks like is from about the 1990s with the Clinton administration, an increased focus on securing our borders, um, on national security. Um, our budget um, for border security has grown tremendously uh, with the number of officers. We you know, had the USA Patriot Act after 9-11. We had, since then, Enhanced Border Security and Visa and Reform Act, the Homeland Security Act, which created Homeland Security, which immigration is now under, the Cirque Cure Fence Act, the Travel and Muslim Ban, um, increased deportation and prosecution of immigrants entering without authorization. So that has largely been the response of the United States government to immigration. Um, 
And as you might have, uh, may might well be aware of, um, there's currently an estimated 11 million unauthorized immigrants in the United States. And this has been partially a result of this highly um, securitization of the borders and this punitive legislative response because prior to this, the border acted more as a revolving door where people came in for seasonal work, return, came in and return, right, for economic um, benefits. Once we increased that securitization, people feared returning and not being able to re-enter, so they've decided to stay. That is not the sole reason, but that's definitely um, an influential, influential reason for the increased unauthorized population in the country. And also, you see here on the screen, this is from last night's, um, updated as of last night, visa bulletin uh, from the Department of State, where if you see um, China, India, Mexico, and the Philippines are the four countries with the most request for immigrant petitions to come to the United States. And it's so backlogged that Mexico, under the prior priority, the F, one, two, three are the priorities, so daughters and sons of US citizens, then daughters and sons of residents, then spouses, et cetera. Um, so Mexico is still processing applications from January 15th, 1999. That's more than 20 years, right? So you see 1997, under the Philippines, you see applications from 2002, um, 2007 from China, and then the, the second column are all the other countries. So we're still processing some priorities, the F4 priorities from March 2007. Um, during this period, people might age out, people might pass away, if you're on Mary's son or daughter marries, then they move on to a whole other category and you have to restart your process. So it might be understandable why some people might decide to not wait and try to make their entry another way. So I've talked a little bit about history legislation and what it looks like. And this is model, this is from a psychosocial research model that informs our work at the Immigrant Network, understanding that immigration is potentially traumatic, like I mentioned. Um, so we divide it into the departure and arrival and reception stage for the actual relocation, geo geocultural, geographic, and cultural relocation um, is the term we use. And understanding that the departure could be um, a period of loss where you leave behind belongings, professions, education, family member support system, Materials were up in, and it sounds like my, t is that my timer? <laughs> my time is up, so I'll wrap it up. Um, so that it is a process where all of these stages are important to take into account for successful post-migration cultural identity, which is integration for individuals to be able to speak the language, to be able to navigate the cultural and societal aspects of our new communities, the institutions, the school, communities of faith, um, civic engagement, voting, and labor. Um, I will skip this because I know my friends will talk about refugees in a minute. Um, the last thing I want to leave you with is um, the change in oversight and immigration throughout this time. So we started to, to address immigration at a federal level under these um, departments. So initially at the beginning, um, in 1891, it was under the Treasury Department. Now there is a German philosopher, Habernas, that says that we shape our world through stories and narratives, right, through discourse. And I believe that is true in that shapes our responses at all levels, the individual level, community, institutional, ultimately to our policies that shape our lives and experiences, right? So it could be argued that at this time, immigrants could be seen as an asset to the economy, right? Immigration was being um, handled by our Treasury Department. Then in 1903, we see a shift that it goes to the Department of Labor. I think initially it was the Department of Labor and Commerce, and then a few years later it was just the Department of Labor, until 1940. So it could be argued that at this time the perception of immigrants was as laborers and workers, right? Again, more positive messaging. Then in 1940, it shifts to the Department of Justice. Now the Department of Justice handles our criminal laws and prosecution, right? So it could be argued that immigrants can now be perceived as criminals. And if we look at any general narrative of immigration, we can see those messages, right? Um, and then obviously after 9-11, 
an understandable response um, to the terrorist act of 9-11, we see the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, which now houses ICE, which is Immigration, Immigration and Custom Enforcement, and USCIS, um, which is Services um, for Immigration Petition. So then it could be argued that we are now shaping immigrants, the perception of immigrants, as terrorists, right? These narratives, this discourse have an impact on how immigrants feel welcomed in their communities, on how they feel saved, the ability to participate in integration, and how these shapes our policies, like I mentioned with the securitization at the border, that's been primarily the legislative response, completely parallel to this discourse and narrative. Um, so that's what I wanted to, part of what I wanted to share with you today, and hopeful that understanding will help you contextualize the stories that you're gonna hear after this afternoon. Thank you. Papers everywhere. <laughs> I'm just going to leave this set up for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elsabel. That was a really great start for this afternoon. There's so much. <laughs> uh, so, next, uh, I want to introduce Alexandra Weber, and she is the Chief Institutional um, Advancement Officer at the International Institute of New England. Um, and we will hear about that organization. They, we, we had the privilege of having them um, come to our last concert um, in our summer music series. Uh, and when. Um, uh, uh, Seth Moulton came and, and talked to us a little bit, and they in, that inspired us, I think, really, to get focused on this symposium and that this was the subject that we wanted to move forward with. So, um, so Alexander, we, we uh, really look forward to you telling us about what your organization's doing and um, uh, give us some... Uh, uh, stimulation to move forward. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to orient myself. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you for inviting us again um, and for all that your your uh, community is doing. Um, and thank you, Isabel, for putting everything uh, that we're going to talk about today into context, which I, I thought the last piece of also what you said was was really powerful um, and a way to sort of understand. I'm going to share a lot about how refugees, uh, what, what, what we have to do to, to create um, like a, a basic, tangible, technical welcome for refugees. But I think what Isabel was pointing out is how people actually feel when they get here and, and in part why. Um, so my name is Alexandra Weber. I go by Zan. Uh, I, I, I work at the International Institute of New England. Um, we have three sites in Boston, Lowell, and Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, before the, my current role, for the last uh, 13 years, I've been working in programming, and I'm a social worker. Um, and so I've had a lot of experience in, in welcoming newcomers and in the refugee program, and I'd like to share some of that with you today, as well as um, a focus on Afghan evacuee resettlement, which is very, um, very unique um, in, in terms of um, what we've done in the past and um, who's coming into the communities now. Um, so the Institute's mission is to create opportunities uh, for refugees and immigrants to succeed. That is uh, a privilege for us. Um, that doesn't mean we create success. Uh, that's it's really a partnership on the part of our our uh, our you know staff, our communities, um, and people themselves. Uh, we have programming that helps them when they're first in the country, um, and it's it's designed as a continuum of services. Um, and I have a little visual of that. Um, we try to think about our services um, in an, a way that helps us organize. 
um, a theory around what people need when they're when they're first arrived. Um, and for the mo most part, most people need resettlement, which is really welcome. Um, stabilization services, so as they get uh, connected to communities and services, they're becoming more and more stable to set up their life in the US. And then um, integration services. And that I, we don't think of this as, as completely linear. We really think of the integration of individuals as a two-way street, uh, transforming both communities and the individuals themselves. The Institute services uh, along the continuum include refugee resettlement and case management, employment, and English as uh, for speakers of other languages support, um, and then um, goes all the way to, uh, we have a legal program, so citizenship. And in between those services, we do a great deal of orientation. We do um, just welcome and connection. We, we work with um, a very, very large um, volunteer community. Uh, we have a youth mentoring program. We serve victims of human trafficking. We serve uh, unaccompanied children coming to reunite with their families. So there's a whole bunch of services within within this mix and this continuum. Um, and um, you know, it, again, it's a two-way street in terms of what how people um, experience the U.S. Um, at the beginning, uh, who helps them, um, and and how they move forward. Um, so this is just a little bit more about our services. Um, we serve, now it's about 3,000 people a year. Um, and some of the services are, are very specific to refugee resettlement, and some of the services are much broader to a variety of, of both um, authorized and unauthorized um, immigrants. So a little bit about Afghan uh, resettlement. Um, so as you probably know, um, and you've you know, spoken with Seth Moulton, who's been an incredible champion of, of, of the response, the U.S. response to the U.S. pullout of Afghanistan. Um, so August 15th of 2021, tens of thousands of people, um, Afghanistan were evacuated. Um, many of those people were, were, were evacuated overseas and into third countries and then were moved to the U.S. and put on about eight military bases across the country. Um, at these bases, most families are being processed for things like work authorization, uh, social security numbers. The, this is not like anything we've ever seen. The, the typical resettlement program has us uh, picking people up from the airport right from overseas travel. Um, but the Afghan uh, experience has not been, I'm going to try to move this up. Um, the typical experience. Um, and I think because of the evacuation and the, the, um, the time frame uh, that they had, unlike other refugees, it took, um, a, a, you know, they had to create another process for people to uh, receive medical uh, screenings, security screenings, work authorization, all of the paperwork, and um, that's what they're doing now at these bases. It was very surprising to us. We thought people would be moved to the bases, got sort of set up with their paperwork and then uh, connected to communities right away. But I think for, for most families, they're spending several months um, um, on the bases. And through the bases, they, they have all of this sort of connection and sort of deep paperwork that they're doing um, so that when they get into communities, they can kind of hit the ground running. Um, but um, really importantly, they're also being connected to resettlement providers within, within that process. Um, and this is really interesting because Resettlement providers and the resettlement network across the U.S., um, which began in 1980 um, and has you know, hundreds of providers across the United States, um, was very inactive in the last four years under the Trump administration, where the U.S. really pulled out of refugee resettlement, by and large, uh, from a high of about 100,000 people we were resettling to, I think, around 5,000 people under um, the last president. Um, so. For many refugee providers, you know, the, the period of inactivity meant a lot of divestment in, in programming and um, some of, uh, you know, sort of disruption in partnerships. Um, so it has been an incredible challenge across the United States to welcome what will be about 95,000 people all at once um, and to help stand them up uh, right away. Um, so. The, at the Institute, we were really lucky because we have been working with Afghans for a very long time. Uh, since 2014, we've resettled about 350 uh, Afghans and their families um, in mostly around our Lowell area. Um, we have now welcomed, um, let me see what we're talking about. Um, 
Oh, yep. So now, so we have a, a whole body of community. Uh, we have a lot of Afghan colleagues on our staff. Um, and so in some ways, we were fortunate um, because I think we we're positioned um, to be very responsive to people who are coming. Um, the challenge for us has been the, the numbers of people. So like I said, the resettlement processes and programs have been impacted by the last four years. Uh, the Institute alone is expecting, now it's about up here to 425 people, um, probably around 550 people. Uh, Massachusetts as a state with uh, its other six providers will be expecting, I think about 1,700 to 2,000 people. Um, and families are coming all at once beginning now. So in the last five days, we've received 127 people. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so just a little bit about what we provide. Uh, so when people are first here, they need to be picked up at the airport. And um, I can honestly say, if we don't uh, join them at the airport, they won't know how to get out of the airport. Um, it's really that in intense, and it's that much responsibility. Um, so what we do, as soon as we get a an, an, uh, notice or a, um, of someone traveling to us, um, we connect uh, to our, a landlord, we set up an apartment, we furnish the apartment, we put in weeks and weeks of food, um, and then we go to the airport, we pick up a family, we, we connect in, with their apartment, and we launch very intensive uh, case management services. Um, we provide food and clothing, uh, all basic essentials and toiletries and needs. Um, and then, you know, as soon as people have sort of what they've got, they, they need basically, we start connecting them to um, support systems so they can begin to uh, build a life that they can support on their own. And really the goal of refugee resettlement is to help people in the beginning get their bearing um, and, and then partner with them um, as they're sort of setting up their own life, making their own choices, um, and really starting to sort of set a path for themselves. Um, what's been really challenging with, with the evacuees um, is, like I said, there's so many people coming at once. We can't ha we, we don't have apartments for everyone. Um, we need to... You know, we've reached out far and wide to communities. We have a lot of people staying in homestays, um, with some people now in hotels, and we're sort of doing everything that we can to get to get people set up as as soon as possible after after arrival in Massachusetts. Um, so the challenge of meeting some of the needs um, of families. Um, so. Um, one, I mean, I could go on all day about the, the, the model of refugee resettlement in the U.S. Um, we, it's a public-private partnership, um, and that's the model that was designed by the federal government in, in 1980. Um, that means that the government is relying on communities to support refugees, and it means organizations like us have a little bit of funding. A lot of that goes to, uh, directly to a refugee, and then we rely on uh, communities to help support housing and its availability, food in terms of food banks, um, employment in terms of open opportunities, uh, volunteers in terms of doing all of the, the pieces of the work. So um, just to give you an example, a refugee gets about $1,200 when they're first arrived, um, and that's supposed to last them 90 days. And in Massachusetts, it won't, you know, for a family of four, which is about $5,000, um, if it's 1,200 per person, it doesn't even cover setting, you know, securing an apartment for them. Um, so it's really um, up to the institute and its communities to figure out how do we help people not just make any start, but like a, a good start so that they don't fall into homelessness, so that we um, really honor uh, their, 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 you know, movement across the world to our country. And then in the case of Afghanistan, that we really honor their relationship to us as allies, because that's why the, these people who we're gonna see are, have been evacuated. Um, just going a little bit deeper in terms of, of, of Afghans, um, we, we need and we, we provide immediate supports, but that really comes in the form that's really different for every community uh, that we see. So the more specific that we can be in our welcome and our response, uh, the better. We are looking for culturally appropriate clothing and like shoes. We have diapers and toiletries we look for. Um, we set people up again, like I said, in ESOL programming that's very specific. Uh, many Afghans are coming from rural areas and they're not literate in any language, including um, 
uh, English. So we'll have a, a program for them that is both um, early literacy, um, both in English and in native languages. Um, uh, we also have immigrant uh, legal services, a huge challenge for this community as they were not resettled or brought to the country as refugees. They've been brought to the country as humanitarian parolees. And though they were given refugee status a few weeks ago, in part because of Seth Moulton's advocacy at the federal level, they don't have a pathway to citizenship. They only have parole for two years, which means every every single person of the 95,000 will have to apply for asylum. And our asylum courts have um, five-year backlogs. Um, so one of the things that government has done is tried to create an expedited asylum process. We have a legal program. We're trying to understand what that means. We haven't petitioned successfully for anyone yet, um, and we're hoping it gets a little easier. <laughs> um, I, I'll just also mention, um, you know, when, when you meet someone for the first time, I think that you can expect, um, you know, for, particularly for people who have been evacuated, them to feel, you know, very grateful to be here and I think grateful for to be off the bases now and in, into a community, but also um, what we've heard from many people we've welcomed um, is that they're incredibly concerned about the family and the friends and communities they've left in Afghanistan, and that is just very real. Part of our work now is trying to petition for humanitarian parole for people who are overseas, which unfortunately isn't going anywhere uh, either. Um, and I think people's best route now is sort of to, to go through the Pakistan border and try to sort of escape. Um, so anyway, that, that you can expect that. You can also expect um, people to be impacted by many different traumas, not only the regular trauma of forced migration, um, but you know, I think in this case, um, from separation, um, invasion, evacuation, I mean, this is a lot for someone to handle. So I, I, we expect and we're concerned about people's emotional health when they get here. Um, so you met um, Seth Moulton, which was great, um, and um, he's been wonderful, and I think, you know, for me, working in this field for a long time, I think the the silver lining to what's happening now and the sort of the level of chaos that we have in, in, in our government sort of response, how, you know, evacuation response and now sort of a, uh, I, I think a, a challenging um, domestic resettlement response is that it's really bringing a lot of attention to the work uh, the U.S. does with refugee resettlement, to how it's funded, to what happens in the lives of refugees who, who come, um, and how challenging that is. And one of the things we've been able to do is really sort of advocate for some changes. Um, and there have been some good changes, um, and you know we can be really thankful to Congress for that. Um, there needs to be a change and, uh, to the legal status of Afghan evacuees. Um, but then more broadly, the entire program needs more resources. Um, Afghans are not the only refugees that we resettle, which we're going to hear from from someone next. Um, we've resettled people in, in conflict zones all over the world, and we have for 45 years, and we want to do it forever. Um, and what we need um, are some much much deeper thinking around people's welcome. It, it's a wonderful thing to have communities involved, but our government also has to play a role. Uh, the Institute has been very, very active with the other resettlement providers in asking Massachusetts as a state to play a role, and there's actually a bill now um, that was passed by both the House and the Senate side who are debating the supplemental budget and the $4 million in, um, billion dollars in, in um, ARPA funding that's coming out where we'd like to see um, some major investment, um, both in legal services as well as services going, or funding going directly to uh, um, re resettled um, refugees and evacuees, as well as uh, resettlement organizations trying to support them. Um, and again, like that's would be a precedent for Massachusetts. It's never, it's never uh, invested as a state in, in refugee programming, um, which I don't think a lot of people know, but it's really, really important, um, I think, to make sure that we create a welcome we can be proud of. Um, so just in terms of a little bit of information about how to support um, Afghan ev evacuees and resettlement. There are, like I said, six resettlement organizations across the state, and we're all working all over the state now because we have so many people coming in each. We're just trying to find housing and community everywhere. There's no wrong entry point um, to, to our work. 
Um, we, we need a lot of volunteers. <laughs> we need people, uh, we've, set, we've set up sort of two processes. One is sort of for people who have some time to give and can sign up by activity and that's sort of everything from picking people up from the airport to setting up apartments um, to um, like packing and sorting some of the goods that we have. Another opportunity that we have um, is to go much deeper with, a, with an individual family um, and to create really a specific um, opportunity for that family to get to know you and a team to um, you know help with help with much longer term help with a homestay um, in some cases um, hosting dinners helping with uh, ESOL tutoring like really getting involved and what we've seen from that experience in the past is that families and communities stay involved usually for a couple of years at least um, and it can be a wonderful opportunity um, for both I think. To, to really sort of get to know each other. And I think people in, in communities will know a little more what it takes <laughs> um, once they know people really much better. Um, so I'll just end with that. The best thing that you could do, if you haven't already, because your community has supported us and you've also donated, um, but if you could stay in touch with us, it would be wonderful, and that would just be signing up for our newsletter. We push out a lot of information on our newsletter. Um, there's also opportunities, like I said, to, to get involved in volunteering, um, and there's a couple of different options there. And then, of course, to donate, and we also are so grateful for what you have already given us as a gift. Um, but if you have friends and family that you'd like to connect to, it's just, there are, there are going to be Afghans and, and other refugees in your communities all, all over the state, and it would be wonderful for you to share what you know about that, and then really try to see, like, what can you do to get involved? So I just want to end there and say thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, next on the agenda is um, uh, Andrew Allen who, from Wellspring and Francis, let me see if I can pronounce his name correctly. Um, okay, Francis, so Franzia, Franzia, Franziza, I knew I was <laughs> missing a Z. Would you like to come up, the, the, the two of you? Hi, everyone. Hi. Those are two X that are hard to follow, so I won't. Um, <laughs> my name's Andy Allen. I'm the Director of Adult Education at the Wellspring House. Um, I'm thrilled to be here this, evening, uh, this afternoon. Also with me um, is Francis, who I will introduce very shortly, as well as Melissa Buchanan, who is our ESOL coordinator. Melissa will be joining us on the panel um, to help answer any questions. Uh, my presentation is a little bit different. Uh, I want to talk to you about what's happening at Wellspring, give a general introduction, and then really let you hear from someone who was a refugee and get a first-hand account on the story. Today I was thrilled to watch his children dancing in Uganda um, with Melissa this morning. It was quite entertaining and it was thrilling. Wellspring itself is guided by the vision of a just society where every member of our community thrives. We are innovative. We're a welcoming learning environment where people push beyond the limits of their lives to realize success and fulfillment. And for each individual, that is very different. And I think we have to remember that it comes in different types and there are many more barriers that we don't think about that happen every day for individuals who aren't from this country. 
Wellspring inspires families and adults on the North Shore to achieve employment and financial security through stable housing, education, job training, and career readiness. And also speaking to this goal is we have a tagline. And that tagline speaks to this idea of endless possibilities. And when someone comes in from a different country, that's a really hard thing to understand, let alone someone who is um, a citizen. Within the context of working with refugees and immigrants, we believe that if we can have participants enter programs such as our English for Speakers of Other Languages, it sets the groundwork, um, but we can also meet their own personal goals. It is often that Melissa talks to me about um, things that our students need that we may not be giving them, different steps that we need to take. And um, with leadership, we, we go in that direction as best we can. Along the way, we make sure that each member is well-versed in some other offerings that we have. So often when you think of a refugee or an immigrant, I think we think ESL or we think language-based. But um, they also want to seek high school equivalency, secondary education, a career, um, job training, and all of those things are opportunities that are happening at Wellspring. I want to give you just kind of like a little pictorial. I'm not going to go through everything. But each country on the left is representative this year alone. Each country on the language spoken is represented on this year alone as well. Melissa will speak more into this at the panel should you have questions as well. But I want to focus on a few things. Just this year, 21% is Brazil, 28%, 29% is Guatemala, as well as Congo, which is 1.5%, and Egypt and El Salvador. We work with individuals in Paraguay and Morocco. So when they walk in the door, that's what we're working with. And what their language are, basically we see Portuguese and, and Spanish. That, that's the major. But it is not unheard of for us to see Creole and Kinyarwanda, Arabic and Korean. So that's in one building with one coordinator and three instructors that really are two instructors that really help that program run. But then there's so many other programs that we offer that acts as a bridge. In terms of, um, sorry, I'm hitting the wrong things here. In terms of our race, you can see that um, other, other multiracial, 47.5%, and the black African at 45 and then white at 34%, it's pretty high. But 60% of that is Hispanic Latino, 37 is non-Hispanic Latino. And so within that Hispanic Latino, we, we capture most of our students. No matter what we do when we're working with refugees, immigrants, when we're working with students in general, we know that they, seek, that they can seek assistance from Wellspring, and we know that it's a new era. We know that things are changing. My predecessors, my two um, speakers who just spoke, spoke of that. They talked to you about the change. They talked to you about the five-year backup. They talked to you about the difficulties. But more than ever, we support our, the, the ambition of our refugees and immigrants, and it's really hard. For that reason alone, it is our desire not to just sell a program, but to create a safe environment and a pathway for them to work with. And we believe in, um, we, we believe in them and we want them to have the courage. We want them to feel included. We want them to feel valued. We want them to feel that they have integrity in our community and they're in a safe space. And often when we talk, it, it's not so much the case. So we listen and we act. Our goal is also self-sufficiency. I was at a, um, sp a speaker series the other day, and they, they were co commenting on how they want to help out in Afghan. I believe you'll hear from that individual today if Alice Erickson is here, and she'll speak to self-sufficiency. I don't want to steal your thunder, but it really lit the way. So the lucky part is, is that's my speech. That's my part. Now you get to hear what really counts. In a few minutes, I'm going to introduce you to Francis Innocent Franziza. 
In 1996, Francis, at the age of seven, fled his village in the Democratic Republic of the Congo with his family due to extreme ethnic violence. He eventually arrived at the Kiangwali refugee camp. After his initial years in the camp, Francis worked with the United Nations Refugee Agency, UNHCR, to provide services to the vast refugee community, including assisting with resettlement applications. In 2016, five years ago, Francis finally immigrated to the United States and settled in Gloucester. However, his wife and two children remain in Uganda. Francis speaks 10 plus languages fluently and works as an interpreter in addition to the other retail positions. Francis and the members of his extended family have worked with Wellspring for several years, and it is my sincere honor to introduce him as she shares his story with you. I would like to say, though it is common to refer to places such as the Ki Ngwali as a refugee camp, the United Nations and those residing there, such as Francis, call it a settlement. For example, the Ki Ngwali settlement. That would be different language that may appear but may help you. Francis? Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Sandy and Charles, for giving me this opportunity to share my story with you. Uh, originally, I'm from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, from North Kivu. Democratic Republic of Congo is a country well known for the worst humanitarian crisis in the world, ethnic violence, civil war. Five, five million people have been displaced within the country and outside other countries. More than six million people have died because of such violences, known for hunger, poverty, sexual violence, mineral conflict. Uh, in 1994, there was a Rwandan genocide that killed more than 800,000. It was a violence that was between the Hutus and Tutsis. A lot of Tutsis were killed. Then the Hutus who had committed crime in Rwanda crossed to Democratic Republic of Congo to Kivu, where I was born. And when they reached in Kivu, my family is Tutsi, where we lived. And remember, they fled from Rwanda because they had killed a lot of Tutsis. So they fled to our province, that's uh, North Kivu. And then in 1996, uh, we started being killed. We were targeted because of our tribe. There were a lot of raping. People were tortured. People were killed. Women were raped. A lot of violence, rooting because of the Hutus. We were targeted that we are not Congolese. We needed to go back to Rwanda, but we are not Rwandese. We are Congolese. We were born in Congo. We are Congolese uh, like others. Being a Tutsi doesn't mean someone is not a Congolese. So we were discriminated of who we were. We were killed of who we were. I witnessed my sibling being killed, my mom being raped, others being killed too. I saw a lot of dead bodies when I was young or like when I was still in the Democratic Republic of Congo. My village was targeted. There are a lot of Hutu, Hutus from Rwanda who fled from Rwanda, who targeted our village because we are Hutus, I mean because we are Tutsis. They came and joined other Hutus from Congo and other groups or militia groups like the Mai Mai who also targeted Tutsis saying that we should go back to where we belong. So for fear of being killed, we fled to Uganda, but we went walking for several nights and days before we crossed the border. And then we crossed the border, went to the to uh, Kisoro district, and we were in a 
a camp, a refugee camp that was called Nyakabande or in Kisoro district near the, custom, uh, the customs of Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda, Bunagana. We stayed there for six months, but while we were there, because it was near the, the, the borders of Congo and Rwanda, we were still being targeted because those, guys, those people used to come to the refugee camps, kill people, kidnap people. While we were there for six months, the United States and uh, the UNHCR decided to relocate us from uh, Kisoro district to Kiangwari refugee settlement. I lived in Changwari refugee settlement for 20 years. I was a refugee in Changwari refugee settlement for 20 years, but while we were there, we still had difficulties because that camp was predominantly occupied by Hutus. So we still had the same problems. We were discriminated. We were discriminated, but like, we did not get equal services like other refugees because like hospital, schools, because most teachers were Hutus, most doctors and nurses who worked in the hospitals in the camps were Hutus. So we were discriminated or we were denied equal rights and education. Some of us decided to leave the camp because we are, like me, I have a lot of scars on my body because I was beaten for who I was at school, even on the streets. Like, I have my sisters who have babies, not because they were in, like, they loved someone or they had husbands or they had boyfriends, but because they had to do it for them to be able to be given something or even be accepted at school. So it wasn't too good. But while I was in a refugee camp, I decided to move out of the refugee camp, sneaked out. However, it wasn't allowed because we were only allowed to be in a camp and we're not supposed to join other Ugandan nationals because they believed refugees were criminals. I sneaked out and went and did my education outside the camp. I finished my junior college, then come back to the refugee camp, worked with UNHCR, assisting refugees with applications to different countries like the United, the United States, uh, the United States, Canada, Norway, Australia, and other countries because of the languages that I was able to speak. But while I was working with the UN, I, I was still hired by other non-profitable organizations to, because of the language that I speak. I was also hired by the Ugandan government. I worked for the office of the prime minister because there are other refugees who came to the camps, not by UNHCR, but they used to cross the border and pay transport to come to the settlement camp. So I helped like, by interviewing them before they are given asylum to the refugee settlement. And how I got to Gloucester. In, in 2011, there was a, uh, a priori UN priorities for resettlement. Uh, they decided to start. Uh, they decided to start uh, resettlement processes for single mothers. There were single mothers who came to the camps. Their husbands were killed, and others separated with their husbands during the war. They did not know where they were. So the UN decided to prioritize such kind of people, the single mothers and unaccompanied minors, or refugee unaccompanied minors. And that's when the resettlement processes started. But earlier than that, people still were being were resettled or were supposed to be resettled. However, the system wasn't good because people who worked there decided to use it for money as a business because, like I said, we were the minority. So our ethnic group wasn't given any chance. We stayed there for a long time. Whereas in 2016, there was another system that was uh, introduced. There, was people, there were people who were qualified or who qualified for resettlement because of how long they stayed in the camp. Like we who fled our country in 1996, we were not recognized as, refuge, uh, as refugees from Congo because the Congolese government said that we were not Congolese. They said we were from Rwanda and the Rwandan government did not accept us. So 
we did not have anywhere to go. We did not belong to any government. So the UN and the US government decided to give us a priority to be resettled to the United States. That's how I managed to come to the US in 2016 after staying in the refugee camp for 20 years. However, when I left, I still left there my kid and my, my, my son and my wife was pregnant. My daughter was born when I was here. I managed to join my family here in Gloucester. When I, when I was uh, in Uganda, I had a lot of expectations, especially with the movies that we do watch, and even the food, the foods that we were given back in the refugee camp. Because every food that we were given had a logo or a tag or a, that says USAID. So we, when I came, before I came, I thought coming to the US, I knew I was going to live American style, live so good, good food, car, happiness. And I was shocked, first of all, for the first time when I came, I think whoever picked me from the airport when we were driving, when I reached um, Route 124, I never expected to see roots, I mean woods in the United States. So I stopped him, I was like, stop. <laughs> I said, where are you taking me? I knew I was going to the United States and where are you taking me? He's like, yeah, I'm taking you to your house. I'm like, nah, why are we in the woods? So I called the police. I said, can I call police to make sure I'm going where I'm supposed to be? He's like, yeah, sure. So I called police. I'm like, this guy picked me at the airport, taking him to the US, but I don't know where he's taking me. So they were like, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Gloucester. They're like, oh yeah, this is we're going to Gloucester. So yeah, they brought me here <laughs> in the Gloucester, but I never expected to see anything like woods. I, you know, I thought everything was good, good houses, like yeah, from the movies that I watched. Yeah, and then the reality, of what I found when I compared to my expectations. I even, when I was back home, I thought I would get money. Like, I didn't know that I could work there at night. When I got here, doing one job was difficult because like when I came with my expectations, I promised my wife to give her a lot of money, buy her a car and do a lot of things. But I was shocked for the first four months. I was not even able to speak to my wife because I did not have money. It was too hard to get money. And even when I got money, it was still too hard to pay for my rent, buy food, and even support my family because I had to like pay for her rent and buy her food. It was really very difficult. It was so hard compared to how I knew before I came. Then I had a lot of challenges when I got here. First of all, I had a cultural shock. One of the things was, one of the best African compliment was one of the worst American, can I say insult or anything? Cause like back home, like my wife or any other woman, someone will look at my wife and say, or tells me is like, oh, Francis, your wife is getting fat. And I say, oh, thank you. With God, everything is possible. So <laughs> for us, someone increasing in size, it's part of being healthy. It's a good compliment. And when I was here, when I was working with my workmate, one says, oh my God, I can't believe. She go, and then I was like, why? She says, I think I'm getting fat. Then I say, yeah, you are. <laughs> and she was mad. I was like, why are you mad? Why would you say I'm fat? And I said, yeah, because you're fat. So I did not know that it was a bad thing. So, yeah, I was really shocked by the culture and then even how I was perceived by other people. Like people asked me different questions. Have you ever seen a car before? Like, did you eat on a plate? Do you guys drive like lions? Do you guys talk to lions? Do you guys sleep with lion? Like, I'm like, no, well, you know a lion eats meat and <laughs> do I look like a stone? So it, 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 was, it was a lot. 
even like how people judge my accent, it was funny how people thought my accent can affect my ability to doing things. And one of the things I told them, like, if you think I have an accent, you have an accent because you speak different from how I speak. You know, it, it was a lot of things. Yeah, and then, like, another challenge was lack of education credentials. Like, even my junior college that I spent there, can I say it was kind of useless here? Because for me to be able to do, like, things that I want to do, I have to go back to school, which is kind of not very easy. I would love to go, but still, I have to work. I have to work day and night to be able to pay for my bills, pay for my rent, pay for my kids. Now I have two kids who are in school. I have to pay for school fees. I have to pay for their food. I have to pay for their medical bill. It's, it's kind of not easy. And I've, I started applying for their visa since 2017 up to today. They haven't been able to come. I'm still working on it. I'm still patient. Hope one day, maybe one day, I'll be able to get them here. And the most positive things here I got here in the US or in Gloucester is freedom from hunger. It's not as I used to be in a refugee camp where I had to eat only once, also on time, like when I was in a refugee camp, I had only to eat once and only one type of food, which is really very different from here. And then there's peace and safety, justice, land of possibility. You guys say it's a land of opportunity. I would say it's a land of possibilities. And then it's your opportunity to make it happen. And then, like I said, also in December on 8th, I'm glad that I'm going to do my citizenship test. Hope I pass. And, and I also thank every individual or for the support that they gave me. There are a lot of people here in Gloucester who are so supportive. They supported me a lot. They taught me how to do things, even how to behave to people, how to talk to people. And Wellspring, I've been working with Wellspring for at least more than three years with my family, like I remember when my, my, my mom came here, she only how, knew how to speak French, but now she can do even her own appointments in English because of Wellspring. They've really supported them, they've showed them ways to live around. And I was surprised that my mom was even able to go by herself and she went to Amsterdam, from Amsterdam to another country. She was able to read posters and talk to people in English asking for direction. Thank you very much for everything, and I thank everyone in Gloucester for the support that they've really given to us and all other immigrants here. And just finishing, sadly, up to today, refugees in North Kiva are still fleeing because of the ethnic violences from different militia groups. Still, my tribe or People who speak my language are being targeted by a lot of people. Even the Congolese government itself hires people to come and kill us, saying that we are not African because in Africa they believe we are not African. Even from the stupid history of when I did political education from school, I was taught that we just came from above. That's how they told us. So up to today, people are being killed hope maybe one time things will change. And thanks very much for really giving me this opportunity for sharing my story and even, I really don't know what to say, but really thanks very much. And another thing, that's my wife. That was my first time I met my daughter since when she was born. That was in 2019. It was my first time I met her. I left my son when he was too young. And that was when I met them for the first time. But I'm still working hard, though. The process is still delaying. But I really have hope. And I'm strong. I'm, I'm still trying. I believe in try and fail, but do not even fail to try. So I'm resilient and patient. Thank you very much.
Uh, we'll take a few minute break right now and then we'll come back and uh, listen to Blanca uh, uh, tell her story. So um, there's some coffee and um, donuts, scones outside if you want to, um, to have some. We have to eat outside though, but uh, help yourself, please.
seats. Uh, we're going to bring our break time to a close. As you've noticed, we've, um, we've strayed a little bit from our very neatly planned hourly breaks. Um, but I think that the messages that you've heard have been so compelling that uh, we just have to run with it the way it wants to go. So um, if uh, people who are out in the entrance house could gather up the others who are outside, uh, we'd like to uh, restart the program. And to those who are tuned in from um, the net, we appreciate the fact that you are with us online and that um, we did have a little uh, technical issue and that you managed to go from the Gloucester Meeting House website over to the church's website in order to see this live stream. Uh, we will have the entire video available on the Gloucester Meeting House uh, YouTube channel uh, after the program is done. So if uh, friends and family were not able to be with here uh, this afternoon, you'll be able to tell them to go to the Gloucester Meeting House website and are directly to YouTube to the Gloucester Meeting House YouTube channel and the entire program has been recorded. So um, it's a way of sharing, of sharing the information uh, of the messages that you heard tonight uh, being uh, distributed on a much more uh, broad basis throughout the community. So I'm going to call Sandy up in order to introduce our next presenter. And I wanted to uh, bring to your attention that in our third segment, the Q&A with the round table, that we have left cards in the entrance house for anybody who wants to write down a question. Um, and so if you would do that, if you have a particular question that you want to address to the panel, um, and since we're not a large group, uh, if there are follow-up questions, we'll bring a mic out to you in the audience. But um, at the next break, perhaps, if you could write down your questions, that would help us uh, be well organized. So thank you for all coming. And um, Sandy, come on up and do the next. Thanks. Um, so at, um, at this point, I would like to introduce Blanca Martinez, uh, and she works for the Essex County uh, Community Organization in Lynn, and she's going to share with us her personal story of coming to the United States and settling in. Hello, thank you so much for inviting me, Sandra. My name is Blanca Martinez, and I live in Salem, and I'm from Honduras. I came to this country because of this, of the dispirit situation in my country, and because I was being persecuted. I suffer discrimination because of my physical condition, because I am black, and because I am a woman. I contract polio when I was one year old, and my parents gave me away. I grew up in the orphanage. Tough of my childhood, I have a fourth surgery and I spent 10 months in the hospital and two weeks in coma. After a war, I still have a lot of pain and walk with great difficulty. I was, difficult this, I was a difficult decision to come to US. I have to decide whatever to stay in my country 
and suffer violence and personal attacks or takes the danger journey to US. I felt I had no other choice but to try. Before I crossed the Rio Grande, I broke my ankle and I was carrying a path of the way of the US. I was captured at the bar and I was put in detention for more than two months and a half. And I experienced terrible treatment and immigration detention. After my realize, I was able to come to Salem with the help of friends. I went, I went so badly to work, but I haven't been able to get work, able to get work paper. And my medical condition makes it too hard for me to do physical labor. In my country, I went to the school for six years, um, but I am thirsting to learn. I, I found free English class at Catholic Charity, and I study hard. In four years, I haven't gone from almost no English to being a teacher ID and translate them for a new immigrant in English language program. Two years ago, I have a hiring with the immigration judge. He denied my asylum. And I was terrified that I will be departing back to the persecution in Honduras. I fear for my life. I could not sleep. I went to depression. This is when I meet my community member at ECHO for the first time in the moment when I will feel afraid, hopefully in this spirit. I remember the first time that eco community members and clears came to support me at at my eye checking i could not believe all the support that i experienced even though i was so afraid of receiving a deportation order and i didn't feel alone. I didn't feel alone anymore. And I felt safer knowing that this community is with me. After that, after that day, I was able to create deep relationship with others who were also struggling for justice against the system that, that I want to keep us down. What I love about ECHO is that it's not just about supporting people who are having a hard time. It is about working with us. So we discover our own power when I start coming to community meeting in meetings to the immigrants leader group. I met many people who were experienced the same injustice and who want to fight together with me. Many of us could not get good job or good housing because our status makes us vulnerable to bad buses and bad pay. Together with the support and training of ECHO, we create vision of a cleaning co-op where we could be the worker 
and the honors. Doing the work we want to do without, without explosion. Now, after much planning, training, and dreaming, trying to get a cleaning cooperative is reality. Looking back at the time when I came to the United States, I feel so much more powerful now, and I have a lot of more hope about the future. Echo did not make me powerful. I have the power for inside of my whole time. But being part of the community who is fighting for justice, showing me that when we are in solidarity with each other, and we understand that our struggles are connecting, we are really can create the change that we imagine. Thank you very much and for listening to my history. Thank you very much, Blanca. Um, and now uh, we are going to hear from Rona, uh, and she's going to tell us, first of all, if maybe not everybody knows Rona, but she's a, a pastor at the West Gloucester uh, Trinitarian Congregational Church. And she is uh, the leader of an organization called um, allies of our Afghan allies, and she's going to tell us what they're organizing to do at this point. So please come on. Peace and grace to all of you, and thank you for having me here to speak a little bit about this initiative that we've started. Um, and. Thank you for the many blessings of this day. I've learned so much. Uh, right around mid-September, Mayor Safati Romeo Tekin uh, reached out to me and said that she'd been speaking with former Mayor Bruce Toby and he and his daughter, uh, Donna da Dr. Dana Toby, really wanted to get together with some folks and see what we could do about welcoming some Afghan refugees. Um, I heard a wonderful phrase from uh, our denomination's Office for Resettlement and Immigration, and it was, we need to move with the speed of the Holy Spirit. And so we've been really trying to move with the speed of the Holy Spirit in gathering together this group. So at that initial meeting, it was Mayor Romeo Taken, uh, former Mayor Toby and his daughter, David Holden from Gloucester Housing Authority. The first person I reached out to is my um, dear friend and close colleague and fellow church member, Alice Erickson. Um, Reverend Erickson has spent most of her ministry doing refugee resettlement decades in Tennessee and in Massachusetts and knows so much. So we all got together um, in the mayor's office with a representative from Seth Moulton's office named Nisha Suarez, she's the Director of Constituent Service. And from there, we just really launched this brainchild, thinking about who do we need to speak with and how do we go about the next steps. Um, Alice's expertise brought her to call Catholic Charities to be the intermediary agent. They're the ones who work with the, with the government. Um, so our task right now, I don't want to take up too much of your time because I, I know you'll have questions and, and uh, there are fascinating people here to hear from um, and you can, you can look us up online. Uh, we had a meeting on Tuesday night, an, an open meeting for the community and we held it at the Rockport Congregational Church. It was extraordinary. It was grace upon grace. 80 people showed up in person and another 60 showed up online and how many volunteers, 100 volunteers nearly we have. 
and uh, people are supporting us really well financially. We now have enough money and enough volunteers that we were able to say yes, once we find apartments, that's the, the housing issue is the big issue. Once we find apartments, we can say yes to a family and to a number of individuals and welcome them to Cape Ann. So we're, we're ever so thankful this, for the support and the enthusiasm for um, being allies for our Afghan allies. Alice, what did I forget to tell people? I think, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did forget. To, I did forget to tell you one thing that's important. Um, Sandy introduced me as being the head of the. I, I'm not actually. I'm probably the person who knows least in the room. But um, that night, Tuesday night, our great friend and colleague, Reverend Elsa Marshall, stepped forward and said that she would be the director of allies for our Afghan allies. So the way it's gonna work is that Elsa is going to be the, um, she'll be the sort of the hub and we'll be communicating with the heads of various task forces, transportation task force, English task force, um, cultural assimilation task force, housing task force, uh, transportation to medical appointments and such. All these little task forces will be trickled down so that the heads of these Task forces will have teams of volunteers who they can call on to take care of the needs of our new neighbors when they arrive here. Did you all hear that? There's a, there's a handout over on top of the piano, and it explains about the different volunteer opportunities, and Reverend Alice is the person to email if you'd like to sign up to be on one of those task force teams and how to donate. There's a GoFundMe. You can also look up information on the West Gloucester Trinitarian Congregational Church website or Facebook page. There's information there about how to contact us for um, volunteering and questions and money. Okay, thank you. Elsabel said that she had a, a, a kind of a nifty exercise of immersion, and so I'm looking forward to seeing what that is. All right, so while I get myself ready, you're going to need a piece of paper. And if you don't have paper, I have some that I can pass around, and a pen or pencil, something to write with. So once you have that piece of paper, you're going to fold it four times. So what's going to happen after you fold it four times, you're going to end up with 16 squares on that paper. So you're going to rip it along those lines, and you're going to end up with 16 squares. Thank you for the assistance, passing out paper and pens. Thank you. 
So for those getting your pieces of paper, you're going to fold it four times, and you're going to end up with 16 smaller pieces of paper. So after you fold it, rip it along those lines, and you're going to end up with 16 separate pieces of paper, small pieces of paper. And don't worry about the neat lines. They don't need to be straight. So we'll give it another minute or so. I still hear some paper ripping. Okay, thank you so much for indulging me in this exercise. This is called the refugee journey. And this is to ask us to really think and put ourselves in the place of someone having to make this decision and live in this experience. So you're gonna create your first pile of four papers. And in each of those four papers, you're gonna write four activities that you enjoy. So you're going to grab four of those smaller pieces of paper, and on each one of those four, you're going to write an activity that you enjoy. It could be reading, dancing, going out to dinner, spending time with family. So four activities that you enjoy. Okay, so once you're done with those first four, you're going to grab another four pieces of paper. And on each of those four pieces of paper, you're going to write four things that you are thankful for. So four things that you are thankful for. This could include people in your lives, pets, material things. So four things you are thankful for. So, so far we have a pile of four with activities that we enjoy and a second pile of four things we are thankful for. Your third pile of four is going to be people that are important to you. So people that are important to you in your lives. In your last pile of four, you're going to write four roles that you are playing in your life. So four roles that you are playing in your lives, whether that's professional, personal, teacher, faith leader, a friend, a parent, a partner. So four roles that you are playing in your lives. So again, that's activities that you enjoy, four things you are thankful for, four people that are important to you, and four, four roles that you are playing in your lives. And after you are done, I want you to turn your piles 
over. Actually, no, you, I'm sorry. Don't do that yet. reiterating my instructions to my volunteers there. <laughs> so now what I want you to do is choose one from each of your piles. So you should have four piles. Choose one and tear it up. You have about 30 seconds to make your choice. And tear it up. And tear it up. Choose one from each pile and tear it up. Dispose of it. Crumple it. Throw it to your side. As you are doing this, I'd like to invite you to think about how does it feel to have to make such a quick decision about what you are giving up. There are families fleeing. How do they choose what to take? Do you take your sacred book? Do you take family photos? How do you choose? What do you choose? Okay, now I'd like you to turn your piles over so that you can't see what's written on them. Now without looking, take one from each pile and again tear it up or crumple it, dispose of it. So now I'd like to invite you to reflect on how does it feel to not know what you have lost? How does it feel to sit on a refugee camp or across a border and not know if your brother made it out safe, if your mother is still alive, if your neighbors have made it? These are the unknowns of the migrant and the refugee journey. Now I like to call on my volunteers who are not paying attention to mommy. <laughs> Go ahead. Now my volunteers will walk around and they will reach for your piles and take some of your papers. So, as we walked around and just randomly grabbed paper from your piles, how does it feel not to have control? This is the loss of control. And some of you are confused to handing me your ripped papers. And I was like, no, I want the whole ones. I'm here for, the, for what you've still got. Right? So this is just a little reflection on how that journey and how people are so vulnerable of this journey 
and have so little control over their lives in this act of survival. And I'd like to leave you with a question on, to reflect for the rest of the afternoon and beyond on our response to immigration. Is it a moral or ethical choice? Is it a legal choice? Is it a practical choice or all of the above? Thank you for indulging me in this. that we are schedules changed a little bit um, we were going to have a break right now before the round table um, I'm thinking that maybe we, uh, do, are you all feeling like you need a break no, no. no I think maybe we should those participants if they could come up to the table uh, and um, maybe we'll take some questions from the audience. I mean, we had thought we would r write them out, but I don't think, have you gotten any of those? No. I think, uh, I think that's what we'll do. So if you uh, would please find a seat. Ask them to raise their hand if they have a question, and I'll bring the mic to them. OK, all right. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. And everybody's, is everybody here? I guess so. One, two, three. Okay. Uh, we'll start with one question that uh, we've, um, we're given, and then we will open it up to the audience. Um, so do, do teachers, principals, and members of the school boards have adequate training and information to deal with immigrant families? Uh, if not, what can be done to help? So I think we can just have a conversation with all of you. I mean, I can speak to, um, as being a former principal um, and teacher, I think one of the things that we we're, we're learning is that there is a, re, a desire to have that happen. Um, I think it depends on what district you work in. Mm -hmm. um, what you'll see in Boston is most likely very different than what you'll see in Manchester. I do believe that um, it is a work in progress and that they are um, partnering. I know uh, Wellspring is working with Gloucester Public Schools directly. Um, to begin a training um, in that very thing. I, I, I could just add, um, there's really not a lot of funding for that. And I think really it sort of starts with where we put our priorities in terms of, of resources. I, I know teachers have a lot of professional development. And my God, they have so much else in terms of responsibility. Um, but I, I do feel like we have a very small like federal contract to do a little bit of what they call school impact work. It's really like $10,000 to work with like a school system that might have 1,000 kids and 200 refugees entering it. So it really, I think it comes down to, I think the will is there. I think teachers are extraordinary and want this information. Mm -hmm. um, and then over time, I think certain teachers and school social workers get so, so impressively connected, involved, and supportive, responsive, um, but I, I would say it just starts with resource prioritization. And I'll just quickly I'd like to add that it's also um, dependent on the community as well, what kind of resources and support the community can provide the school district in your own towns and, and cities, um, connections to school committee, PTOs, and so forth. But I agree, there's a, there's a desire and there's a challenge to deliver to that desire. I'm Alice Erickson, and um, 
a few years ago when uh, there was quite an influx of undocumented persons uh, into Gloucester, the school system was initially overwhelmed, but very responsive. And a fund was set up by a number of people who were concerned about the undocumented high school students in particular. And that fund uh, is, there's still a small balance in it, but that fund has provided assistance with housing, with clothing, with school costs, with athletic um, mm -hmm. costs, and with legal help. Uh, the legal help is what is still ongoing. And um, I can't say enough about how proud I am of the Gloucester school system for responding in that fashion. Uh, so uh, at this point, uh, if anybody in the audience has a question, if you raise your hand, um, and Charles will come around with a microphone. Um, Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Martin Ray from Gloucester, and I can readily see how this uh, community can can uh, respond in a material way with and, and with all kinds of generosity. My question is, when a family comes from a completely different part of the world, how do you how can their community and social needs be met over the long run if they are parceled out here and there and um, they're isolated essentially not only from their home country but from uh, compatriots, shall we say. Uh, I can see how it might be manageable in some place like Lawrence or Boston, but how does Cape Ann fit in or uh, be of be of help in that situation. Is that okay? Please. Um, it is a challenge. It doesn't mean that uh, we should refrain from resettling people. Um, it adds to the uh, diversity of our community and the people coming in need a stable home. But it does point to the fact that uh, you have to pay special attention to how people can uh, find support in that community and in nearby communities, whether it be through cultural events or social events or family reunification or uh, you name it. Um, so initially, it may be a problem. Um, when I was speaking with Catholic Charities yesterday, they said, um, we envision having an Afghan cluster on Cape Ann. And I said, I'd love to see that. We already have an Afghan family uh, that's in Salem now that started here. We have several other Afghan families that have been here for many years. Um, some of the, it, the Peace House in Ipswich has uh, been resettling Afghans in the past few weeks. Um, and so we are not alone. But we will have to pay particular attention. And if we don't, what will happen is probably people will move away. So, and that happens. Um, but on the other side, when I was in Nashville, this was many years ago, we had a community that was prim primarily black and white. Uh, there are very few Asians in Nashville. There are very few people from uh, Africa. It was, uh, it, it, there, there was very little diversity. And um, we started a resettlement program with the Vietnamese, and it moved on to the Lao and the Hmong, 
and then the Cambodians, and then we resettled the largest um, Iraqi uh, Kurd uh, settlement in the United States. Many of them moved to Washington so they would have a better chance at advocating for, their, for the Kurds in uh, Iraq. Uh, it was understandable. There's a very large Afghan community in Nashville. There were Cubans. Um, it became a very, very diverse city. And uh, one of the great advantages was that we had about 12 different soccer teams, or football, depending on how you want to refer to it, mm -hmm. um, a very, very competitive league. <laughs> I do, and I believe the gentleman referred to the social and cultural uh, challenges uh, for both sides. And I think it's important to remember that um, people can be genuinely curious about each other. And if you approach it with a certain humility, there's a lot you can learn from each other. And I like to frame everything within the socio-ecological model, if anybody wants to look it up after. But it goes into the levels, starting with the individual, the interpersonal community, institutional, societal. At that individual level, what can you do, what can I do as an individual when I encounter one of those families? Maybe it's just saying a good morning at the drop-off line at school, right? Um, starting up conversation at the school meetings, taking them out for coffee after, connecting with those individuals, because the more welcoming we are at that individual level, the more integrated and comfortable and safe they're gonna feel in that community. And these individuals are ultimately gonna be our coworkers, the parents of our children's friends at school or grandchildren, right? The um, people who are opening up businesses in our community driving up that economic level. So um, always think, what can I as an individual when I encounter this person do to learn from them and they bring them an opportunity to learn from me as well. And, and people coming into the United States generally are hungry to learn about American culture and society. Okay. Uh, another question. Um, uh, is the powerful influence of social Darwinism on U.S. immigration policies, past and present, uh, included in public education, about refugees and immigrants. Included in public education. I'm not going first on that. <laughs> <laughs> I have my thoughts, but I'm not going first. I think you just started. No, no, no. Yes, no. go. Can, yes, please elaborate. Yeah, can you elaborate a bit? For the video. <laughs> Shout out to Echo, by the way. Yeah. We have it on Cape Ann, occasionally revitalized. Um, my name is Wendy Fitting, and uh, my, my clergy friends, I will apologize ahead of time, because you're going to hear about that thing that I talk about all the time, <laughs> which is eugenics. Um, the overview of the history okay, that you, you gave was very thorough. I wasn't aware of the stuff that was earlier, like in the 1800s. Um, what's typically missing, and it's not your presentation, it's everywhere, is the hidden history of the eugenics movement in this country, which of course influenced Hitler, and uh, foundation money from this country was actually funding uh, Dr. Mengele's work with twins. Eugenicists go crazy for twins, okay. Uh, we still have that very much with us. Uh, that idea that certain people are gonna poison the gene pool of the white race, okay. Uh, Pat Buchanan used to talk about that a lot. Mm -hmm. It's still very much with us. In fact, uh, Stephen Miller, who was uh, uh, Donald Trump's head of immigration was outed by the Southern Poverty Law Center mm -hmm. as a eugenicist. And uh, I just, I, I, I think it's a huge influence. And I, you know, it's not inclusive. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not good with devices. <laughs> okay, thanks, Charles. Um, we all need assisted living. Um, and I, I just, I see it, you know, you can see it uh, everywhere. The idea that uh, people <laughs> Southern Europe. I'll hold it. No, just okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're excluded, you know, in the heyday of eugenics, and these draconian immigration laws were put back into place by Trump and somebody like Stephen Miller, who's in charge of uh, refugees and immigrants, and thinks they're coming over to pollute. To, to, to be criminals, to pollute the gene pool. So it's something that, you know, they just took Margaret Sanger off of the Planned Parenthood headquarters in New York City, and it said in the news article because she was a eugenicist, but nothing about what that means. And I think it's really important for us to know about that and face the fact that it's still very much part of our unconscious beliefs about people coming from elsewhere. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Any comments about that? Absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing that up. And um, I'm on my second year of a PhD program, and the one thing that I've taken away so far is to say, I don't really know. That's not my area of research. <laughs> <laughs> Please do, because I'd be really interested. Um, but what I can say is that um, our immigration legislation has been designed to highly favor European immigrants who happen to be mostly white. And we see the introdu introduction of restrictive legislation when we start seeing non-white, non-European immigrants coming into the country. And that's exactly what was the intention of the 1965 Immigration and Naturalization Act. And before that, the first half of the 1900s were nation quotas that when you look really in depth into it are race-based quotas because it restricted immigration based on national origins. And it was clearly in favor of immigrants from Europe primarily Northern European countries. Um, so when, once you look through the history of it, it, it's all there, absolutely. It is, but it's, it's yeah. But I, I, I definitely agree with the calling it out and naming it for what it is. And actually, I, I just remember during the Trump administration, there were several lawsuits that came out of detention centers because of medical procedures that were done on detained women, mostly from Central and South America. Yes, with abortions and reproductive procedures that they had not consented to. So. I also think it's important to call it for what it is. And in all our honesty, look at how we teach in K-12 settings today. Look at the history of slavery. Look at how, how we represent refugees. Look at how we represent immigrants. And it begins by teaching our young. And it begins by working our way. And it begins by accepting others' um, history and letting them know, but also showing what's wrong with it. Um, I'm well versed in the Holocaust. I'm well versed, I don't say his last name, but I'm well versed in the doctor's last name in which you spoke of. Um, I think it's current, it hasn't gone away, it continues to be here. And one of the questions is how do we? Well, we start like we're having now. We have um, Alice Erickson's expertise and Rona's and Zan's and. Um, Bianca's and we we speak to these things and then we get more ideas and give voice uh, get voices from each of you and then we speak out and make it more public so you just did a very big thing by even bringing it up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll just add one more thing um, I, I'm not an expert on international Re resettlement, Re like this is, we do domestic resettlement in the U.S. and there's a whole other sort of 
system and process with the United Nations and the refugee missions programs of many countries overseas. But I do think it would, it's very important to take a look at who we're resettling, N not to think that resettlement, you know, we resettle less than 1% of the world's 65 million refugees. Um, it's, not a, it's not really a solution. It's a, it's a I, I like to think of it as a, um, kind of a reflection of a commitment uh, and a really important one. Um, but you can take a look at like who's resettled in what political climate and context. And I do think it's very, very political. I mean, under Trump, you know, there was a Muslim ban. Um, by and large, mostly Christian refugees came to this country. Um, and I think, you know, again, I haven't researched this, but I do think it's, it's very important that your legislators hear from you about who and what, what we're doing. And then the person who shows up in front of your door, who's a refugee, just gets your love and your welcome, because mm -hmm. everyone deserves that. And lastly, if I might add five seconds, the U.S. definition under immigration law of who is a refugee does not meet the international ref definition of who a refugee is. So, Can you say a little more about that? Well, for instance, on an international level, um, a refugee could be a displaced person within the boundaries of their countries or or outside of the national borders for political persecution, warfare, natural disasters, et cetera. So under immigration law, there are very specific people from def very specific countries that would qualify as that refugee status because, and Alexander can speak more to that, but it's the government who decides this particular group meets that definition and the government decides to bring that group to resettle to the United States. So for instance, none of the groups from Central America, Latin America, or the Caribbean meet that definition status. So if you know what's going on in Haiti, Haiti is an absolute chaos right now. Mm -hmm. Haitian nationals do not fit the definition of a refugee under the U.S. immigration system. El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, when the war was happening in Colombia, none of those folks met that definition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Um, so I'm Ruth Lieberman. I live in Magnolia. Um, it's probably pretty basic, but I'd love to know um, more about what uh, I understand housing is a huge, huge challenge. Can you talk about um, how it um, gets subsidized if it does? And, you know, hotels, how long can they stay? Um, what is home stay? And then, you know, in this housing market, how do you get housing for these people? Um, the Afghans who are coming in are not eligible for subsidized housing. Uh, housing is, has to be up to code, and it has to be, um, it follows, generally speaking, Section 8 guidelines, so the correct number of bedrooms, et cetera. Um, for the past few days, we've had a couple people out looking at apartments, uh, I have to admit, I hadn't looked for an apartment for a long time, and I was shocked by the cost of apartments in Gloucester. Uh, it's about, average, about $2,000 a month for a two-bedroom. Um, that's usually not including utilities. That's a lot of money. Um, we have been told, uh, and I, I think it may have been different for International Institute, um, but we have been told that we need to find an apartment before the families or individuals will arrive. Um, that we may not uh, rely on temporary housing. We have had um, some very generous offers um, from people for temporary housing. Um, but that is not the way that we're going to go, in part because in order to apply for benefits and uh, to receive your social security card, you have to have a permanent address. So temporary housing is not going to give you that advantage. So we're madly looking for apartments and uh, two or three bedroom apartments, and if you know of anything, Please let us know. 
Did that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so uh, we have six resettlement um, providers in, in the state, and everybody's doing everything a little bit differently. We all have the same subcontract from the federal government um, through a national network. Um, but our actual work with volunteers and communities is, is a little bit different. There's a lot of very interesting new models coming together. Um, so I would say it really depends on who you're working with and sort of what their, their model is. Um, and so I think every provider has something slightly different. I think at the Institute, we have this sort of organ, organized activity-based uh, opportunity and then for for a deeper uh, experience supporting a family we have family support uh, groups teams and um, they come together to support someone for a much longer period of time we don't have the opportunity to not use temporary housing because of the, the volume of people that we're receiving and the government at this point is just it's so un, unlike other resettlement they're giving us two or three days a, a notice before someone is is um, transported off a base and shows up at Logan Airport or Manchester Airport. So um, we have um, we have had some generous offers from from hotels in the area, and we love the idea of giving someone like a private space and their own bathroom and like oh and, you know like a comfortable space. Um, but we try not to keep people in hotels for more than about a week. Um, but I will agree, like housing is the hardest part of our work. And I used to, you know, I started in 2008, I used to thought, think it was hard then, now it's just, it's excruciating. And honestly, not for just for refugees. I mean, just imagine all the communities that are paying these rents that, you know, you were saying, Francis, you need to work several jobs. Like, it is just unbelievable, like, it's unbelievable how, much, how expensive it is. What, the inflation's at 6% now, food has gone up. I mean, just, just being able to just create the, and provide for the basics is, I don't, you know, it's it's painful. Um, I will say that the federal government had, I mean, if, if there was any time to resettle people through mass evacuation, um, it's now because we have a lot of funding for, from ARPA. Um, we have billions of dollars going into every community. So for example, we've been working really closely with the Department of Housing and Community Development at the state level because Afghans are eligible for rental assistance, and that can be up to 18 months, and that can cover your full rent. So there are, I think, changing policies now. Um, so, you know, and I think there's like the opportunity is, like I think I said before, the silver lining is we could actually dig into the way we're doing things, what people can expect when they arrive and make some changes, particularly because of the infusion of dollars all across the country, including our state and our local, our local communities. So, um, you know, I would say that, the, you know, the time is now, that depending on who you connect to, you'll, you'll know what a homestay is. You can ask, you know, more information. That's usually like you're, you're inviting somebody um, to either stay in, in your home. If you have, you know, we have some criteria around that. We like to have people to have a you know, as much privacy as they can. Um, or maybe you're, you're setting up an apartment for them and you're supporting them in the apartment. Um, the most important thing is that we get people supported enough so that they can get into a job that could cover their rent. And that is, you know, that is the greatest challenge. How do you get someone who has to pay $2,000 a month in rent into a job that could actually support that? The average size family from Afghanistan is eight. Many women do not work. Their, their, their roles and responsibilities are, are different. And, you know, with one employable person taking care of a, you know, family that might need a three or four bedroom apartment, I mean, how does that work? So anyway, if anyone has any ideas, we're very open to that. But I think through a little bit more assistance and through, you know, generosity of communities, I think we're going to make it. It's just not clear yet how. And, and if, if I could add, just to remember folks to bring it to a larger perspective, this um, type of assistance and process is very specific to refugee resettlement, and refugees make up a minority of the overall immigrant population in the country. Regular migrants are not generally eligible for these type of assistance, 
And generally, you need to be a legal permanent resident that is a green car holder for at least five years to be eligible for federally funded assistance. So that includes a lot of our subsidized housing program. That includes SNAP benefits. That includes cash assistance, even some health care. So just to keep it into perspective into what's available out there. And that sort of provides you some context of Francis, who can speak to this, but he works 24-7, basically. Yeah. It's, you're going, we all have the privilege to work a set amount, usually it's 40, 50, but this is much greater than that, and that's to support his family here and support his family there, mm -hmm. and to pay rent, which unfortunately, due to the boom and construction, et cetera, is such a great impact. 2,000 could be 3,200 in Danvers, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. for a two-bedroom apartment that does not look like something you might want to stay in. Mm. There's an, another question in the back. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm Sunny Robinson, and I have a question first for the panel, but then for all of us. And it's picking up on what I think Isabel was just saying about the difference in status between people who come in as difficult as it is with the protective status of being an official refugee versus someone who arrives in the multiplicity of ways in which you can be undocumented. I have no doubt as the community of Cape Ann that we will rise as a community to the challenge of assisting whichever people from Afghanistan end up in our communities. But what do we do as a whole community, state, country about the despicable state of immigration legislation and practices that we have at this point in time? So I, I look forward to the ideas from the panel and then from anyone else. Hi, Sunny, it's nice to see you. <laughs> um, thank you so much for asking that question. Um, and that, that's what I was trying to drive, that we've had immigrants within our communities here in Essex County and Cape Ann forever, right? So what, what has been our response to that? And again, I'll bring it back to the socio-ecological model. What can you do as individuals? But right now, we need primarily a lot of pressure and advocacy at the legislative level. We have um, a couple of bills want, there's a hearing coming up next week actually on one of them, the Safe Communities Act, which clarifies the role of our civil police force and of ICE, which have two completely different funding streams. Um, and it just, it basically, it protects that any immigrant, regardless of their status, has the right to due process under our criminal justice system. So right now, you could be pulled over for running a red light, and if you're undocumented, that could get you deported. And the implications of that are huge and immense, right? Anybody else would not have that risk if they didn't um, have that undocumented status. So just clarifying those roles in collaboration with ICE. The other one is the Family and Workers Mobility Act, which would provide driver's licenses to all Massachusetts residents, regardless of immigration status. This is like the 15th time we've introduced this piece of legislation here in Massachusetts. 14 other states have passed similar legislation. California, Nevada, Connecticut, Vermont, right? Um, so why can we not pass this piece of legislation in Massachusetts? And the the arguments against it, to me, are none. I haven't heard any convincing argument against this, other than xenophobia and anti-immigrant sentiment, to be direct. The economic benefits are clearly laid out there. The safety benefits are clearly laid out there. We'll have families being more economically independent by bringing their kids to school, baking it to their jobs. Our transportation system, we know, is not reliable to get people to work. So that legislative pressure and opportunities at the state level and also at the national level. We haven't been able to figure out immigration reform at the national level. And again, it comes back to that. And if you look through our immigration history, it comes back to that. The third wave of migration brought the biggest raise in nativism in anti-immigrant political parties in our history. And that is back on the rise again. So there's many opportunities and things we can do. But thank you for bringing it up to this KPAN level because it's really up to all of you on how do you respond to that.
And there's handouts regarding those bills on the piano. Did you hear me? Yep, yep. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, we're very grateful, though, for all of you being here and presenting, and uh, I'm so impressed with what people are doing, and I think we all, the rest of us, need to get busy in finding this, the piece that we can realistically do, and uh, I think everybody can do something. So that, that's the message, I think. And, and, and it's, um, so I think hopefully we will carry on. And uh, I hope you all have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. One more. One more. I'll hold it for you, George. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we're nice and close to my mouth. Uh, I'm going to ask you the most difficult question of the evening. And uh, it's uh, take the long view and uh, the big picture. The International Panel for Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, uh, with a lot of documentation, predicts that it's baked in for the next 20 to 30 years, we're going to see increasing, accelerating climate change. Now, already we're seeing climate refugees. Guatemala, uh, the farming has become very difficult. A lot of it has failed. Two hurricanes, back to back, more and more rain flooding after and before and after. Uh, the temperatures are getting so hot that certain tropical crops will not grow. Now, uh, oceans, uh, fishing already is declining in the tropics. Fishes are going, fish are going north, and the, the uh, you know, the coral reefs are, are going away. Now, what we're going to be seeing, we, you know, we probably can handle the immigration and migration so far economically. But we've already seen an impact politically. The far right uh, has influenced the Republican Party so much that uh, it's, this is one of the prime drivers, is the migration. Now, in the future, the next 20 or 30 years, after I'm gone, certainly, but we're going to see immigration, that probably, or migration, I should say, several times what we're seeing now. And my question is, you know, where democracy is under threat, look at, look at Poland. Look, they're putting up barriers to, to any kind of migration. Hungary, the same way. Uh, conditions are getting so bad, uh, how are we going to start thinking about handling that? Um, I don't think it's one or the other. As I said earlier, migration, uh, climate change has been one of the three major threats identified to, to the United States and our national security and safety. And um, in the field of social justice, we always throw around the, the term intersectionality. And there is no better time than to be intersectional than now. So I don't think focusing on climate change takes away from focusing on migration and other issues that we have to deal with as a country. We really have to take a step back and take a holistic view as to where we want to be. And they don't necessarily need to be separated issues. And one, one local example is the collaboration that's going on right now between the city of Beverly and the city of Salem with their Safe Alliance. Um, environmental Alliance that's bringing in working with immigrant communities in the art area as part of their efforts to learn what ha people have done for environmental protections in their home countries for generations that they can put into practice now and what can we learn from lessons learned now to protect that. And another thing is that we cannot have an insular view as to what's happening in, the, happening in the United States as we are more of a global society and international society. We also need to be able to collaborate with other countries because if we don't, 
and just take care of what's happening in the United States, it's inevitable, inevitable that we're gonna get climate migrants from other places in the world. Um, but one example of those educational um, things was the, the use of reusable shopping bags, grocery bags. I grew up with my grandmother using the same bag to the market for like her whole life, right? So, and then all of a sudden, a few years ago, it's like, oh, reusable shopping bags. And I'm like, oh, that's a new thing, <laughs> right? So learning from each other, that intercultural exchange, those practices, can address many of the different issues and challenges in our community. I, I'm not sure that answered your questions, but those were my thoughts. I think a lot of it of your question, sir, and it's a great question, mm -hmm. has to do with political ramifications of our country in general. Mm -hmm. We are at a great divide. I doesn't, for me, it, 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 it's none of my business which party you belong to or which party you don't, but we are in a state of great divide. Um, the previous administration really impacted, as you know, climate change in general. And I think it, it's exactly that, looking where we are now and getting the facts about the future, listening to the scientists, understanding the migrant movement, and then speaking our voice and making sure that that voice is heard clearly. What will the impact be? Showing a very specific agenda of what the country will look like in 50 years. It, it's desolate in, in, in some areas and it's, it's scary. And so what I think we need is, is leadership that's going to broach and believe that within this impact it's gonna happen. And yes, I do think it greatly impacts in, in, um, impacts migration right now and the immigrants right now and the, the question, the real question is, is what are we going to do about it because we can make those changes right now. It's very difficult and one group um, is just the start. The voice needs to be heard from out loud. It needs to be, you know, on top of the mountains being screamed down. I was, I was very... I was very struck by Elsabelle's um, description of the changing of the narrative over the years and how it was determined in large part by who was in charge. And Homeland Security has certainly changed the narrative and we have invested a huge amount of money and passion uh, pro and con into building walls, mm -hmm. walls that uh, we think, someone thinks, will keep people out. But those same walls will keep us in. And there is no guarantee that we are exempt from the dangers that await us and await others around the world in terms of drought and famine and whatever may come with it, with climate change. Walls are not the answer, we know that. And I don't think we have answered what we would like to see in terms of immigration policy, but we certainly need to come up with a better answer than we've had to date. I, mean, I think I'll just, and I don't have a solution. <laughs> That's a big problem. Um, at the Institute, we think a lot about climate refugees and we identify Haitian migrants in these deplorable conditions, about 1,500 of which I think will come to Massachusetts, which is the third largest Haitian community in the country as climate migrants because of the hurricanes and devastation in Haiti. And to top it all off, lots of 
these folks have not been in Haiti for many, many years. Their children have been born in other countries. Because our crazy immigration system, they have different statuses, and that, I think we just talked about, means they will have different eligibility for even things like food and medical care. Um, so I would just echo our immigration policy needs to be intersecting with our climate policy and in working with other countries. Again, I wish I had more sort of a, of a solution. I don't think the U.S., even if we had the most open borders in the world, could absorb what's going to happen next with people having to move, you know, to, you know, from where they're at now to other corners of the world because of the climate. So I would like to um, just follow up on this for a second. We're coming up to our, our end of our time. Um, and I think uh, the question that was raised about climate change is so profound. Uh, as many of you know, there are many people here on Cape Ann as well as throughout Massachusetts working very hard on this issue locally and hoping to have a national voice, including the Cape Ann Climate Coalition and a program called Town Green, which have joined hands uh, in studying what we can do that really will make a difference. Um, but it's an enormous subject um, and probably well beyond what we could even hope to touch on this afternoon because we were worried that this subject was already uh, enormous. But before we, we close the event, um, it's so rare to have all of you together. I wondered if anyone on the panel, um, mm -hmm. and Francis and Blanca in particular, if there's anything that we have missed this afternoon that you feel that we should hear um, is there, I mean, we've tried to be very uh, open and let it run so that people would have their voice. But um, from the panel itself, is there anything that you'd like people to leave with um, in terms of uh, your own thoughts or summation? Uh, thank you very much. I think I'm uh, again going to talk about immigration. Like I said, uh, when I used to work with the USCIS or with the Canadian government, Norwegian government, Australian government, like I said, they had resettlement criteria. However, you have to tell a story of why you cannot return to your country. Like I said, there are people who are not allowed by any government. Like, there are people living in uh, reception centers or, research or settlement camps but they are not allowed to go back to their country. And for someone to be able to be resettled, you have to articulate your story, reasons for your fear. And there are those people who have had trauma because of what they've gone through, what went through, what they've seen. And those people have been stuck in areas or in camps or reception centers because they cannot be resettled to the United States because they cannot tell the story, because they lost their memories, or they had, because of the trauma they went through. Like, you people, what do you think should be done, or how would those people be helped? Because one thing is, like, people who work with immigration, can I say they have bookish experience? What I mean is, the experience they have is what they read in books. Someone works in immigration, but they've never like really been immigrants, or they've never had any problem. So it's kind of difficult to understand someone who cannot articulate the story. And the story for them, to, uh, I mean, for them to be able to come to the United States or to any other country, they have to tell the story. Like, you have to tell why you think you should be resettled, what will happen to you if you go back, and there are people who cannot tell because they lost, they lost their memories or because they, of the trauma. Like, what should be done or how can this be had by the immigration people? Thank you. That's an excellent question, yes. Anyone else on the panel want to add before we, we close up um, a final thought? 
Absolutely. Go ahead, Rana. Francis, ever since you said that you're going to take the citizenship test, I've been sitting here wondering if it will make it any easier for your I'm wife. Really to... you. <laughs> My question for Francis is that since he said he was going to be taking the citizenship test, will it be any easier for your wife and children to come and get status here? Yeah, uh, it, it's going to be a little bit easy because most of the processes that I've been doing for them to be here, I've been paying for them. And there are very many processes that I've gone through, like doing the DNA test, filing, all those forms I've been paying. But if I get my citizenship, because I qualify for all other services like any other American citizen, so it will be cheaper and I won't go through these other immigration processes. I will just apply for them a visa. I will pay, but I won't wait for a long time or pay more money to other immigration departments. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Hmm. Um. permanent residency, which is what he had. So for the last five years, he's been applying under a system that, where he doesn't have a very high priority, and there's limits to how many family members can come to the US in that system. So he's been disadvantaged. As When he becomes a citizen, then, that's, then it's a whole new application. <laughs> so now he starts over again, pays a different fee, fills out a different application, but he has much better standing because there's no limit. If you're a U.S. citizen, you're, you, you may bring your family over eventually. For those who are watching online, the answer is yes. Uh, when, when Francis becomes a citizen, it will, uh, it's a new ball game in terms of being able to bring his wife and, and children. Um, and uh, we hope that everybody's been able to stay with us online uh, to this point. I think it's probably time to wrap it up and say special thanks to everyone on the panel. Blanca, would you like to say a few words before we close? Yes. Um, I'm going to say in Spanish, and Isabel, she can translate. Okay, all right. English. So Elsabel's going to translate for you? Yes. Okay. Um, um, yo estoy en el mismo sentir que que el compañero, porque um, mi caso fue negado y yo quisiera también tener mi residencia. He estado pensando qué resolución, porque yo he ido incluso a Washington DC con ECO, a donde los senadores y Yo quisiera tener mi residencia, tener una estadía y poder estar tranquila aquí en los Estados Unidos. Um, so what I'd like to share is that I'm also in, a, in somewhat a similar position as my peer Francis here, where I would like to obtain a green card um, so that I could leave here peacefully in the United States I have even, as you heard prior, my case was denied, and I've even been to Washington, D.C. to advocate for my case. Um, but what I wish the most is to have a green card so that I could remain here and, and continue to live here peacefully. And, and right now, this is me not interpreting, um, it is impossible, nearly impossible, for Blanca to obtain a green card unless there is a legislative change in immigration law. Okay, thank you, Elsabel, and thank you, Blanca. And thank you to the entire panel and to the audience here tonight uh, for participating in uh, this symposium. We thank you all, and we know that you all care deeply. Uh, there are a lot of materials available up here, and you can uh, chat with the presenters if you haven't already, um, and find out ways to contribute or to volunteer. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>